We are going to continue our exploration of innovation, as Sergey says, business model innovation, um, with a number of successful entrepreneurs um, coming up on stage. And we're going to confront, on the one hand, this notion, as Sergey said, that Europe, with incredible diversity, different perspectives, is a great breeding ground for business model innovation. As Andreas reminds us at the beginning, there's a lot of things, a business that works in Europe. At the same time, we need to confront the Achilles heel of innovation in Europe today, which is the venture capital ecosystem does not work as well here. The level of investment is, is not as high. Fundamentally, my thesis would be in part because of the diversity. In the US, if I come up with some silly concept like Cinnabon, Right, Cinnabon, if you combine for Americans fat and sugar and cinnamon, and you discover that if you pump that smell around the mall, Americans will line up. If that works in Cleveland, there is a 300 million person market that you can roll that out. And that ability to scale quickly in North America is, of course, fundamental to the investment thesis in, in venture capital. It's one of the things that's hard to do in Europe, and one of the things we're going to want to talk about with our panelists. I'm going to kick us off with talking about a new INSEAD case study on Blah Blah Car, which was mentioned um, earlier. How many people are familiar with Blah Blah Car? Good, yeah, so it's uh, well known. So I will run you quickly through some of the highlights of its history, and then we'll bring up um, the founder, Frederick Mozilla, and have a conversation with him. So here we go. Um, so the first thing is, put this in the INSEAD context, um, INSEAD, for those who haven't been back recently, is a hotbed of entrepreneurship today. At least 25% of the electives that students take are in entrepreneurship, with professors like Sergey and Karan, and a whole faculty in, in entrepreneurship that we've built. Here's data from PitchBook. So this is tracking venture capital investments with founders from European MBA programs. You can see there, um, INSEAD, easily number one, is much money raised, 1.9 billion in the last um, five years, um, as all the other European players combined. This actually, is, as Ilian alluded to, puts us up there with some of the top US schools. And we're going to look today at one company that's responsible for about 300 million of that um, INSEAD raise, which is Blah Blah Car. So where does Blah Blah Car start, for those who don't know the full story? Well, Frederic, as a younger man, um, was studying in the US, studying um, in computer science, was coming back to France for the holidays. And Frederic, I guess you were lost in your studies, didn't book his tickets, and is trying to get home to the provinces um, and cannot get affordable transportation. He ends up having to beg his sister to drive 100 kilometers out of her way to pick him up in Paris and drive him home. And as he's driving home, what does he see? A lot of cars going the same way with a lot of empty seats. And so the proverbial light bulb goes off, and he thinks, I know, this is 2003. I can create a platform for ride sharing. And he's got the skills. He puts up the platform, the technology. He puts it out there. And what happens? Nothing. All right? This is before the sharing economy, it's, it's hard to make these markets, especially when you have to get the two sides together. After struggling for a few years, he thinks, well, maybe I don't know everything I need to know. Maybe I need an MBA. So he goes to INSEAD. And uh, one of the interesting things about teaching Frederic as, as, as an MBA student is incredibly engaged. So one of your most engaged students, he's really, really interested in what you say, but you always dread a little bit after class. He's going to come up to you and he's going to ask, he's going to say, Professor, that's really interesting. How does it apply to ride sharing? <laughs> and so he was doing this class after class. Um, and uh, one of the things he did is we, we now have a big venture competition where people pitch their ideas. And he pitched his vision, and we'll get, you'll start to see this, this issue of, of business models. He pitched his idea of a C2C model, like matching up people with cars, with hitchhikers, and creating this platform, and he pitched it with passion and slick presentations, and he didn't convince anyone, which is just well, a few people, but he didn't win. And um, 
Part of it is we just couldn't see how you were going to monetize the C2C market, how you're going to even get everyone on. He then came back, the next promotion, met, met up with uh, what ended up being his co-founder, Nicholas Bronson. They re-entered with another business model that we'll, we'll get him to talk about, and they won. And so it was off to the races. This was a, takes a while, but today, um, if you don't know Blah Blah Car, it is probably, the, I think, the, the French startup with, with the most funding valuation to the extent that you like that metric of, of well north of a billion dollars. Um, I'll just, just to give you some context, how fast this went. Um, after about 2012, sort of post, um, um, post as the sharing economy takes off, they finally get their big first $10, $10 million round to basically take what was working in France and spread it across Europe, which is going to be really important. One of the really interesting things about this is this is going to be a winner in part because they figure out how to grow across Europe. Um, so here, for those who um, don't know, here's, I'll, I'll show you, this is their, um, the th sort of thing they made at the time, explaining circa 2012 how You've the service works. You've been there, driving alone in your car. It's very expensive, not good for the environment, and it's rather boring. Alex chose a different way to travel with Blablacar. It's a lot more fun, environmentally friendly, and he even gets paid for sharing his car with passengers going the same way. Every time Alex visits his family on weekends, he posts his trips on Blablacar, fills in his preferences, and Blablacar even helps him to set his price per seat. Kate is a student, Will is an architect, and Harry is a teacher. All three want to do the same trip, but their travel options are limited and getting awfully expensive, especially at the last minute. With Blablacar, they quickly find several drivers, read their ratings, discover their car, and simply book their seat. During the trip, Alex shares his passion for jazz. Kate describes her last trip, and Will shares his biscuits. Yum! Meanwhile, Harry has a nap. Back home, they each give their ratings, keep fun memories of their experience, and look forward to their next trip with Blablacar. Thanks to Blablacar, Alex saves a lot of money in his travels, just like Helen, who's going to a festival to meet friends. Mike and Jane, who visit their children pretty often. Chris, who goes to see a client. Blablacar is the new, unlimited way to travel. How about you? Where are you going? Blablacar.com. Um, so it turns out, however, that just having the light bulb go off, coming up with the business model, is only the beginning of the journey. Especially on this one. It turns out, all around Europe over the last decade, people have been having that light bulb go off and think about, we could create a ride-sharing platform. Um, most of them not very successfully. But there was one earlier mover called carpool.com in Germany. Um, started by MBAs from another school. So you can, the story's not going to well, end well for them, clearly. Um, and, but they are, if you go back to this period when Blah Blah Car, remember, has about 10 million funding, they've also got about 10 million, and they're ahead. Like, this is, you have to think, this is a platform market, um, scale's going to matter, winner take all, market by market, and they're ahead of, of Blah Blah Car. So part of the challenge and the battle is going to wage across Europe. Everyone's rolling out these ride-sharing platforms and trying to win in Poland, win in Russia, in Spain. And they're, they're playing it out. One of the big events is going to be, that I think we'll want to probe with Frederic, is Blah Blah Car, whereas Carpool never successfully enters the French market and, and cracks that. Blah Blah Car is able to successfully drive in and take huge share in um, Carpool's home market, um, and that allows them to play. Again, I can't underestimate enough how important the VC space is, right? If you can get the money, the mere fact that you have a huge round can skew competitive outcomes. It matters, this, this investment confidence, the optimism. Um, out of the success with their business model, with their global expansion, they do a 100 million round just last July. And that round is to take it global. Because Blah Blah Car has not only solved the issue of how to spread within Europe, which we're going to hear about, but they start to use this globally. And so take a look 
uh, when this is the video made recently for the Indian entry, how is it same? How is it different? How is this company, as Andrea said, getting this sophisticated European approach to both, you know, core branding but yet localization? Hi, I'm Rahul. My wife and I use Blah Blah Car to share our city to city car journeys with co travelers. If you are a car owner like me, you just publish the date and details of your journey on Blah Blah Car. The app automatically calculates a fair contribution for co travelers. Amit is a software engineer. His wife Priyanka is an architect. They needed to travel, but their options were limited, especially last minute. Instead of taking a crowded bus, they used Blah Blah Car. Did a simple search for their journey chose me and requested to share my journey I checked their profiles and agreed they enjoyed the comfort of my car and contributed to my driving cars during the trip we had a fun chat after the journey we all gave each other's ratings to build our reputation on blah blah car blah blah car the trusted ride-sharing community Many things in there, I'm sure you're all running through your checklist, but just the shift in demographic, the dealing with some of the safety and trust issues by having couples, um, and yet you still see a core brand occur or message. Um, just to get us up to today, um, Carpool ultimately um, last April sold out, and then um, in September they did the big 200 million round and um, are now one of the best funded, uh, most valuable startups in Europe. Please join me in welcoming Frederick Mozilla. I know, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, let's see. I'll sit here. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so why don't we, uh, I, I'd love for you to share and tell us a little bit about, just on the, before we do the European piece, just on the business model, how did you move from, you know, a business to business model to what you do today? Um, so, um, good morning, everyone. <laughs> on, the, uh, on the business model, we actually tried six of them. Um, and we had most of them already scheduled uh, and as uh, options for us to develop. But then, uh, so we started with a B2B model where we were referring platforms for companies to actually uh, offer a ride-sharing service for their employees so that they could share their rides from home to work. Um, so as you said, the initial idea came from a long distance ride, but you know, after like 10 companies calling you and telling, uh, we want the same thing as what you have online, but for our own company, uh, after having said, uh, no, it's not our business model for 10 times and you're eating pastas for the past two years, uh, you begin to say, okay, so how much? Uh, and then that's how you transfer to the B2B model. And so we, we did that for, we actually implemented 200 platforms in a B2B model for like intranets and um, people placing their uh, software for connecting people uh, for ride sharing on their, uh, on their intranets. And so uh, after 200 platforms, uh, we could, like we were, th there were six or seven players in this space as well uh, doing a B2B platforms. And so we could see that uh, we had become the leader uh, in France on this uh, model because we started from France. And then, um, but then it was not sustainable in the end because uh, companies were not paying enough because we were not a must have, we were just a nice to have. And so you were competing uh, with the best quality of a platform, you were competing with uh, small, uh, you know, uh, consulting companies building uh, uh, s small uh, software solutions mm -hmm. which were not to the level, but which were cheaper. And so we could not deliver the quality of the service with the prices that the market was actually going towards. So uh, the, the, in the end, we didn't have enough, I would say, uh, value to defend and, and have a very high uh, price for selling. And mm. so we moved and we tried five other business models. So we tried advertising, which didn't work because people come on the, on the service to find a ride. They don't come to click on ads. Uh, we tried uh, premium services, you know, where you actually don't, um, uh, you, you have a, a free service for most of the people and then you have a paying service for people who want additional services like being alerted by text messages or having their ads, uh, their, their postings first in the search results. Um, it did work, but only one out of a thousand was paying 
which was not enough. So then you have two options. Either you lower the quality of the free service, which is super bad, so mm. that everybody pays, or you higher the price of the premium. And uh, none of them actually could have multiplied anyway the revenues by 10. And we were very far from uh, being at equilibrium with this business model anyway. Then we tried a uh, phone connection because uh, our members didn't want their mobile phone to be displayed on the service. And so by uh, allowing them to still be called through a phone service, a phone bridge, uh, we could generate uh, a few uh, dozens of uh, K euro a month. Um, and, uh, but still, it was not enough, and it was not easily portable because it was relying on the local business models of telecommunications. Uh, then we tried platforms for events and uh, concerts and festivals, uh, selling them ways to attract people to their events. Uh, again, it didn't work super well. And then we tried the transactional business model, which we have today, which is super simple. Uh, it's for long-distance ride sharing. It's not working for short distances. So we're on long distances. Uh, it's about 330 kilometers in average. And it's when, uh, let's say, your driver and you offer your seats and you want to get 20 euros per seat, then we will sell the seat for 22.50 or something like that. Mm. Uh, we'll get 250 euros as a commission and then we'll give you 20 euros and uh, that's, that's, that's about it. And the big, um, the big improvement with this business model is that it brings an added value, which is engagement between passengers and drivers. Because before we had this business model, transactional, we had a lot of cancellations. Um, basically, uh, people were always arguing, like, for example, their grandmother was sick or what. And so we had averages of uh, sick grandmothers way, way, way above national uh, average. <laughs> um, <and> so, <laughs> or, you know, or just You're saying being hitchhikers sick. aren't the naturally most reliable client base. Well, you know, mm -hmm. when you have to cancel, you always find an excuse, mm -hmm. and it's often your grandmother uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so now that people have to pay in advance uh, actually we reduced the number of cancellations from more than 30 percent to less than three percent so yeah. it divided by 10 so it brought a lot more uh, much better quality much more reliable and so we were able to scale more because when you have a not reliable service where 30 percent of the time it gets cancelled you actually can't get mainstream oh. i mean it's it's a testament to sort of your execution it's really hard to take a free service, which you've introduced into the market as free, which in many cases you had to do because it's a very hard market to make. But then to take that community and move it to pain um, takes really careful communication. Maybe to, to highlight that, maybe you could talk about how the sort of business model innovation interacted with the move to Germany and the competition with Carpool. It's kind of interesting to see how those two areas of strategy interacted. Yeah, we, uh, we knew that Germany was a big market for us, and we had been uh, looking at it for a long time, because you know there are 80 million people in Germany and only 65 in France, and so we, we have other countries in Europe. But when, and we knew our, our main competitor was there. And they were born there, because in Germany, they've been doing ride sharing for like more than 40 years. Uh, they had uh, things called like uh, Midfar Central, uh, for example, where you could uh, actually go and get people to bring you from city to city. So it was nothing new. The only new thing in Germany was that it had been moved from offline to online. And so there were big actors there because culturally it was something that uh, the population was already doing a lot. And so we knew that Germany would be anyway a very, very different market. And so we were and not expecting actually what happened, but um, our competitor in Germany tried to make the same move as us, which we had done two years before, from switching from a free service to a paying service, which is actually super hard to do. It took us 14 months to, to actually switch our business model from the free to the paying model uh, fully. So we had a progressive rollout with uh, the beginning some axes and then uh, lots of communication around it and um, lots of things to, to fix along the way. And, and the way uh, our competitor did it in Germany, they, they had probably not seen how difficult it had been for us to switch. And so maybe they thought it was easy, but they did it from one day to the next. They tried to switch their entire community uh, with, at the time, I believe, three or four million people um, from free to paying. How did and, that go down? And this is very painful. Uh, because what happened is that the entire community complained. It was on the news as well in Germany, like even like the, the prime time news, you know, uh, uh, talking about the fact that they had switched. And so we, we had scheduled to enter Germany maybe six months or 10 months later. But when we saw that, we were, okay, this is a door. This is a door for us. And so we entered 
in 12 days, we translated everything. We already have five, uh, five German people in the team, and they were like super hot to, to launch the, the platform <laughs> in Germany because we weren't there. And so in 12 days, we launched the platform, um, and we were able to get all the media as well because uh, since there was a lot of uh, uh, talking about the fact that this platform has moved from free to paying, we entered, and we entered in a free model. Um, and so it was super good publicity for us, which helped us grow super fast. And then we also raised additional capital to make sure we were able to fund this growth uh, right after we launched to make uh, appropriate marketing to, to grow faster. And then in a year and a half, uh, the situation has uh, totally changed, and we were the leader in Germany. Yeah. And, and then lately, uh, we've made the acquisition uh, in March of, so of this company. Maybe we could switch to this. This so you have. I mean, turns out creating these markets and ride sharing is difficult. And, and you guys became starting in France, where the really the leaders and how do you make that market and how do you monetize it? But then there's still the challenge of how do you grow? Um, and, and maybe you could just talk a little bit about you know how do you organize yourself? How do you adapt to local markets? To what extent do you still keep you know scale economies and such? Uh, we, we have a culture we call global, so we are global but we're local, and so we have this culture. We have 14 offices in the world, uh, from New Delhi to Mexico, and then we um, we make sure our marketing and communication on s in countries is very localized, uh, but we have. Uh, common guidelines uh, for, for branding and for the product, of course. Um, but it, it's really um, a culture like this. And the way we've been growing also, which has worked super well, is by making some acquisitions, which we call like we hires. Because when we arrive in a country and we find a team who's been trying to develop ride sharing for like a few months or a few years, and they're struggling with this market uh, marketplace effect, because you know at the beginning it's super hard to create liquidity in this marketplace because we have three points to match. We have departing point, departing time, and ending uh, destination to match, which is a lot for a marketplace. So the probability that you find two people actually departing from the same place at the same time, going at the same place, is super low. So the fact that the blah blah car brand is well known now is not uh, because only because we we are performing it's also a necessity for us there is no other way for us than to be super well known in order to create liquidity in our marketplace and when we see in new countries some teams uh, new companies struggling with this uh, ability to reach critical mass uh, then it's super good for us because we arrive and we're like, okay, so we've been there before. We know it's super hard. You know, until you get one million members, you will not get liquidity. So it's it's gonna be long, yeah, yeah. super long. We, I mean, it, it and you me have, but you have the systems yeah. and the investment to push. It took in. me seven years to reach one million members, so I yeah. remember that. <laughs> but uh, so um, and so yeah. when you arrive and the team is two or three years down the road, you offer them to join. Uh, and then to offer them like new fundings, uh, a working product, uh, positioning, uh, a customer support, and and uh, and of course all the methods for us to grow. Uh, the last one though is you know as you, you talk about um, the culture is important for for the company. You have this global approach. You now have people dis distributed. You're, you're, how big are you now? You're in people. Uh, Four hundred. Four hundred and growing fast. Do you find it a challenge to maintain the culture that you built, and, and what are you doing Actually, to keep that? Actually, yeah, we, we made one thing which was super good and which was an, an advice from another entrepreneur I had met in 2008. Uh, he had funded three companies, and then uh, he, he gave me some good advice. And also, I remembered that the values were something uh, quite important we had been taught in, uh, at INSEAD. Um, and um, what we did is we... We created our own values when we were 60. We gathered in a room all together, and we said, okay, what, what defines us? Uh, that was almost three years ago. Uh, what do we want to say to the next people who will be joining us? And then we defined our values. And then uh, I was a bit scared at the beginning because you don't know what's, what will come out. But in the end, people will never give bad values. They will always be inspired by good values. They will not say we are proud of doing a, 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 a low quality work. I mean, they will say we want to build quality. Uh, and so the, the values that came out of it were about innovation, about learning, trust, uh, the fact that failure is part of success uh, if you learn in between. Uh, and, and, and the fact that we enjoy working together. So now we, and then we made some poetry. So we have 10 values, uh, which are actually values like fail, learn, succeed, uh, in trust, we trust, 
fun and serious. Um, think it, build it, use it, which is super good for us because we're using our own product to improve it every day. Uh, and I realized that values actually replace processes in the growth phase because you don't have to, you don't have time to establish processes when you grow so fast. It's uh, it's impossible because everybody's innovating in all directions. The only thing you can do is make sure everybody's got the same mindset. And so this mindset is reflected by the values that you created together. And since you created them together, you crowdsource them from the team, they are accepted and lived. They are not uh, thrown by the top management to the team saying, this is our value. Uh, but when you crowdsource them, it's super powerful. And, and it makes people more responsible and more autonomous because they make their own decisions, so they own them. And uh, they're, they're, they feel uh, some more freedom, mm -hmm. and it's much more efficient than, um, than to follow processes because the value is a bit vague. It's just a mindset that uh, applied to the decisions mm -hmm. that people make. It makes them feel totally autonomous and mm -hmm. responsible. It's a nice example of also what Gilbert was talking about this morning about just how the nature of leadership is shifting, and sort of some, especially as it markets move fast, people's expectations are somehow that you're going to give them the values and let them do their thing as opposed to, you know, control them through processes. Um, I'd like to we've, um, bring up a few other people leading successful startups, open up the conversation, see what's common. But first of all, please, a round of applause for Frederic. And um, why don't we show you? Why don't we, um, Frederic's brought a video. So why don't we um, just close off this piece, and why don't you show the, uh, the video of, of Blah Blah Car? It's a small video about what we do and the human side and the... the, the uh, the emotions behind what we build and the way we change people's life. Uh, so I don't know if we can launch the, the video now. Of, of Marianne. Me llamo Marian y estoy estudiando un máster en Sevilla. Hace dos años ya que empecé una relación a distancia con mi novio que vive en Málaga. Entre Málaga y Sevilla hay 200 kilómetros de por medio que no es prácticamente nada. Y nos dijimos, no puede ser que no nos veamos todos los fines de semana, pero claro, teníamos que encontrar una opción que nos permitiera hacerlo sin arruinarnos. Y fue así como conocí BlaBlaCar. Me lo dijeron unos amigos, me metí y me hice el perfil. Gracias a BlaBlaCar hemos podido cumplir nuestra promesa. Nos hemos visto todos los fines de semana. Nos ha aportado, por supuesto, independencia en todos los sentidos para poder organizar nuestro tiempo, para poder organizar nuestra relación e incluso para no organizarla y que salga algo espontáneo. 